OK, uh, welcome back everyone. We'll make a start with our, our second panel uh, of today's conference, which is uh, on internment Bally Murphy and its aftermath. We have three speakers, um, uh, so uh, I'll ask you to hold your questions until all of our speakers have um, given their presentations. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Martin McCleary. Uh, who holds his PhD in politics uh, from Queen's University Belfast and who has been a lecturer in intelligence studies at Cardiff University. Um, Martin is the author of an important monograph uh, on Operation Demetrius and its aftermath, a new history of the use of internment without trial in Northern Ireland, um, 1971 to 75, which came out with Manchester University Press in 2015. Um, and Martin is going to uh, speak to us today specifically on the question of internment failure or success. And I'm going to move Martin's slides on uh, as we go through. So Martin, you just indicate when you want me to do that. Over to you. OK, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so when I started to think about writing my paper today, uh, it brought me back to 1971, which is, uh, I suppose, one of the most seminal years in my early life. But in 1971, at the start of 1971, I was living with my family in a small rural town line just outside Lurgan and Cardiana called Dry Drasna. But there's no way in any shape or form my family could have been considered a Republican family. My, fa my grandfather was Richard McCreary, a Protestant from D Street in uh, East Belfast. And some of the more eagle eyed of you may notice the difference in the spelling Richard McCreary as opposed to McCleary. This is because when he was 15 years of age, he changed his name for, uh, in an effort to join the British Army to fight in World War I, which uh, happened. So he was in the British Army, and then after the, the war, uh, he met my grandmother, who was a Catholic from Port Down. And as a consequence then, my father and all his siblings were reared as Catholics. And due to a set of unforeseen circumstances, oh, I should say this is, you're probably wondering about the photograph. That's a photograph of my grandfather and my grandmother on, on their... Um, wedding day. So due to an a set of unforeseen circumstances, and not through choice really, uh, my family moved to a Republican state in Oregon in early 1971. So with the move to this area and the introduction from Termond, uh, really the republicanization of my family occurred. So knowing this family history, I was always extremely interested in 1971 and internment. So when it came to my PhD, uh, it just seemed a natural topic for me to research. Although I thought, you know, that everything that had been written about it had been written already. Although when I looked at it, I, I sort of became increasingly convinced that further research on the measure was desirable and necessary. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today then, my research uh, on internment. So uh, next slide, Peter. So yeah, the title of my paper is Interment in Northern Ireland, Failure or Success. Uh, next slide, please. I suppose the simple answer is, was it a failure? The answer is yes. So we possibly could have one of the shortest conference papers, certainly of today, maybe ever, if I just leave it at that. Yeah, it was a failure. Or maybe, maybe, maybe we look a little bit more into it and, and sort of look at the reasons why it was a failure and the reasons that have been given for it being a failure uh, and sort of look a little bit deeper into this. Next slide, please, Peter. So there's been a number of sort of reasons given for why internment was a failure. One of them was that it was an indiscriminate attack on the nationalist community. And many Republicans would, you know, certainly at the time and all try to portray it as such, and subsequently a lot of people uh, see it as such. Um, but I think if, next slide, Peter, sorry. So I think if we look at the arrest figures um, uh, for the actual arrest operation, maybe it doesn't look as indiscriminate as it's been portrayed. So Peter, you'll sort of have to uh, hit, hit enter every time you so if you head under one centimeter in the first segment, you come down. Hopefully, no. Okay, well, we've got the figures there on here. Yeah, yeah, this is a match. Yeah. So there was 520 people on the original arrest list. And out of those 178 evaded arrests, approximately 34%. I think it's fair to assume that a majority of the, those people who evaded the arrest were members of the provisional IRA, as that uh, they have been given the uh, four, Knowledge been they've been given information beforehand that the arrest operation was um, about to take place, and were instructed volunteers were instructed to stay away from home. 
Uh, out of those arrested, approximately 50 were uh, members of the provisional IRA or so people associated with it. So roughly 10% of the uh, total figure. 75 of those arrested were members of the official IRA or their associates. And in fact, 116 people were released within 48 hours. Uh, so 22%. So actually, out of those on the original arrest list who are actually not involved in anything and who were detained for longer than 48 hours, or so, just over 100 people or 19%. So I think the figures sort of allude to the fact that maybe the arrest operation wasn't as indiscriminate as has been portrayed. Uh, next slide, please. Sir. I can't see it as it moved on. Well, maybe I'll, just, I'll keep on talking and then maybe catch up with the slides. Uh, so one of the other reasons that was given for uh, why the uh, operation failed was it was a mistake based on poor intelligence, which led to an increase in support support for paramilitaries and consequently the levels of violence. Well, certainly, you know, I don't think it can be argued that it, it, it um, increase the levels of violence and also support for paramilitaries. But how poor was the intelligence? Um, that is a question. I would argue that there seems to be that there was a, actually a reasonable a level of intelligence on Republicans. In fact, uh, Jim Old, who's one of the first guys who was arrested in the internment operation, uh, maintains that the um, security forces post sort of 1970 and the Falls Rose cur curfew, there had been an influx of, yeah, that, that's okay there, Peter, thank you. Um, new members to the provisional IRA who the security forces didn't know, but they did know the main players uh, uh, at the time. And so if we look at the actual arrest list in here, uh, we can see this is the arrest list for Lurgan area and Lurgan Port Down area and Cartier Armagh. This is a segment of the arrest list. And we can see that we have the names of a number of problem, prominent Republicans, such as J.P. O'Hagan uh, and Jared McCure, the provisional movement, and John McMahon, the official movement. So we see we've got their name, address, date of birth, and uh, employment status. Next slide, please, Peter. Also, each uh, a suspect on the arrest list was given um, a code, as you see here, from Juliet 9, Juliet 11, etc. And against that then was the details of their vehicles. So we've got things like their vehicle registration, the make of car, the size of engine, uh, the color of the car. If we go down to yes, the uh, Hotel 7, we can see that they have the knowledge that he has two cars, one being his wife's car. Uh, Juliet 29, we can see that we know it's an ex post office van. So I would argue that this certainly demonstrates that there was a reasonable level of intelligence on the main players within the Republican movement. So next slide, sorry, Peter. Yeah, so what what other reasons could there possibly have been for the failure of the operation? Well, I suppose, as I've already alluded to, uh, I would argue that there was a, a reasonable level of intelligence on the main players, so um, the, the, there was a limited intelligence, but not poor intelligence. Um, the restless, I think, have been augmented, so people who were put on the restless who shouldn't be on it, to give the impression that the unions were come, uh, or Faulkner was uh, conducting uh, effective arrest operations, so to placate the call of, from hardline unions for action to be undertaken. Uh, the actual operational instructions on the day um, that was given to the security forces also contributed to the failure of the operation, and obviously the levels of violence used at that time. And I'll just not go into that too much because I'm sure Liam's going to uh, talk about that when he talks about Bottle Murphy. Uh, the use of torture as part of the operation, how it was applied geographically, and the fact that the operation was in part uh, conducted as an intelligence-seeking operation as opposed to an intelligence-led uh, operation. Next slide, please. So this idea that was the operation was conducted to uh, placate the call from, from hardline new people within the unionism uh, is given some credence when we look at this quote from Robin Bailey, who was a minister in Faulkner's uh, government. So he says, at present, we are in a position of some political strength. Paisley's power and credibility have been greatly shaken in the last two weeks. 
on the proper Gander front, our standing is better than it has been for some time. So I think we'll see here, as really is quite clearly indicating that the introduction of the tournament had helped Faulkner uh, in his internal battle within the unit. So next slide, please. So also the operational instructions, uh, instructions contributed to the uh, portrayal or the idea that the uh, operation was a failure, or a uh, fact that it was a failure. So it's, for example, soldiers were told that if suspects cannot be identified by the military, all males over 18 years of, of age at a selected address are to be arrested. So if soldiers basically went into a house looking for, say, Martin McCleary and he wasn't there and they didn't have a photograph, they were to arrest anybody over 18 years of age in the house. So this obviously contributes to the appearance of the operation being conducted. You know, as a, it was an indiscriminate arrest. Next slide, please. So in relation to uh, torture, you know, there's been uh, many, uh, and this is sort of torture, I think Tom referred to it earlier as, you know, uh, ill-treatment, but I, I, I would define it as torture, and I think on the modern-day uh, viewpoint, it would be defined as such. And it, it contains sort of six techniques as opposed to five, which are most people uh, believe. So that there was hurting, white noise, wall leaning, little food to drink, wearing of loose overalls and sleep, sleep deprivation. So obviously the use of torture on these some of the detainees uh, obviously was going to contribute to the opposition once it was revealed, revealed at the stop and to, up to the field of the operation and people were not supported. And there's also been this idea put across that you know a lot of people in the military didn't know about the, 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 what was going to happen. But I think we can discount this when we look at this uh, memo from Brigadier J.M. H. Lewis on the 27th of August, 1971. So he was a senior army intelligence officer, uh, officer involved with intelligence work in Northern Ireland at the time. And he says in the memo, the Home Office was fully represented on all interdepartmental discussions surrounding the internment. And these included the establishment of an interrogation centre at Bully Kelly. There can have been no doubt in anybody's mind as to the purpose of which the camp was being uh, modified. So I think that's the kind of idea that it wasn't generally known what was going on or what was going to happen. Next slide, please. Just a little bit more on the use of torture or sensory deprivation. Um, this is a quote from Paddy Joe McLean, who's one of the people who, who underwent uh, the six techniques, and it says, whether you're innocent, as I was, or guilty, it makes no difference. They weren't concerned on whether we were guilty or not. Indeed, they knew that some of us were completely innocent. They were concerned with our reactions to the extreme stress of sensory deprivation. So I think it's got to remember that all the techniques have been used in a colonial context, different parts of them. This was really the first time that all, all they'd all been used together. And I think, you know, it's quite possible that the British were taking what sort of having a control group, if you like. So, so getting innocent people, subject them to the techniques, seeing if they're going to work or not, to see whether they would give information or admit to things that they hadn't done before. So, next slide. So, how did the geographic application also uh, contribute to the field of the operation? Well, if we look at four provincial towns, Lurgan and County Armagh, Murray and County Down, and Gannon and County Tyrone, and then Eskillen and County Fermanagh, we can see that there were 108 what I term TRIs, trouble related incidents. This includes murders, deaths, bombs, shootings, rats, arms fines, bomb scares, protest rallies. After the introduction of internment, we see on, in the next 18 months, we see a 400% increase in these sort of incidents. So given the geographic area, uh, uh, it's really relatively low levels of violence, you know, prior to the introduction of internment, outside of Belfast and Derry. So cut internment had been uh, introduced in Belfast and Derry alone, as in fact it had been considered. And it, it's given a wee bit more credence by some of the statements of people who were interviewed uh, just after the murder of the three Scottish soldiers in uh, 1971. Sure, as far as we're concerned, the trouble in Belfast is as far away as the Apollo 14 astronauts are now from the moon. To my mind, Belfast is a place apart. It is a problem that cannot be solved. Okay, next slide, please. So I just wanted also to say uh, a little bit about the internment of loyalists. So some people have suggested, and certainly at the time was suggested, that the reason loyalists weren't interned because there was no um, information on them, or no intelligence on them. I don't know how clearly you can see the document, mm -hmm. but it, this is an RUC special dance memo from uh, 21st of May 1970. 
So the RUC at that stage, as early as that stage, were asked to uh, compile a report on what the likelihood of uh, an internment operation and who would need to be arrested. So we can see here, uh, we can see it close enough, Republicans are suggesting 61 Republicans uh, inside Belfast and 64 outside, 145. We're saying that there should be 32 extreme loyalists and 30, uh, sorry, inside Belfast and 30 outside, and then a total of 15 on it. So we can see here clearly the RUC special bonds uh, indicating that a loyalist would need to be interned in the, the number of loyalists that would need to be interned. So there was obviously information on uh, loyalists. Next slide, please. Indeed, between the introduction of internment in August 1971 and the start of the loyalist internment in 1973, over 100 ca innocent Catholic civilians were murdered by loyalist paramilitaries. So this shows a quite a high level of activity by them. And uh, constant documents, government documents, con constantly detail that the reason why loyalists weren't interned at this time was the, because of the fear of an even greater Protestant backlash. And this is actually the actual arrest policy for Protestants from the 11th of December 1972. So it states the policy does not therefore provide for the arrest of Protestants or non provisional terrorists, except as the object of bringing a criminal charge. Protestants are not, as the policy stand, arrested with a view to being made subject of ICOs, interim custody orders, and brought before the commissioners. Ministers have not judged not the time is not the moment is right for the extension of the arrest policy for Protestants. So clear policy of not arresting loyalists was implemented. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to say a, a, say a little bit possibly about, you know, uh, and I suppose the title of the paper is a little bit controversial, it says in terms of failure or success. But in any sort of, from any viewpoint, can it be considered that it was beneficial in any shape or form or a success? Um, I suppose if you look at it from a parish perspective, um, it did certainly increase the support for the movement. Now, whether or not you believe that the power was trying to agitate, you know, for some kind of draconian measure, um, what is true is that it definitely did increase support for the movement. But one, but one power, power volunteer did give some indication that, you know, that they were they were trying to agitate. So we we'll quote a quote on me says, "I was expecting internment as an IRA volunteer. I've been on the run for several months. We wanted to get behind the public reaction to, to utilize it and to exploit it." So that's possibly, yeah, that's certainly one benefit that the provisional IRA got from it. Also, uh, we, and with the creation of the Long Cash Internment Camp, we've got to remember from 1972 onwards, there was very little people inside the internment camp who weren't actually members of the Republican movement. So, uh, as has been stated many times by uh, Republicans themselves, you know, Long Cash was like a, a, a place through where ideology was nurtured and military drilling and tactics, etc. So that's another benefit. Now, there's no doubt that the actual uh, support for the provision of uh, the Republican movement increased in this period, but from 72 onwards, post bloody fighting, all it did also wane, you know, uh, as has uh, also been documented. However, it seemed that I would maintain that it left the provisional movement, certainly with enough core of support within their own community, to sustain them through the 1970s until the uh, hunger strikes of the 19 early 80s, when they got a reinsurgent of more support. So what about the British government? Was it successful or beneficial to them in any way at all? So um, is it possible that it was beneficial for them in political manoeuvrings? Uh, next slide, please. So in a recent article that, I, 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 uh, that Tony Craig and myself wrote, we argue yes, that, you know, that the release and arrest were used actually as a political bargaining chip. So we look at the graph, the two, two lines I suppose we really want to look at is the grey line, which is releases, and the orange line, which is arrests. And if we look at it close enough, we can see that in the talks with Paris on the ceasefire of the 1972 period, uh, releases were increased and arrests were decreased. And the same happens with uh, Sunningdale. Indeed, uh, if we quote some of what, what Whitelaw says about the period, he says that releases from internment were uh, part of the bargaining of power sharing executives. He also says, first I decided I had to release some of those interned. I needed to encourage the SDLP to build up their cooperation with the government and security forces. So what this suggests is that the British got found the uh, internment useful where, uh, as a political, in the political negotiations were going on, as a tool to isolate the moderate, na the moderate nationalists from militant republicans. And I also must be remembered that they had to, they wanted to end internment as well, but they wanted to do it without a Protestant backlash, a severe Protestant backlash, which they also succeeded uh, in doing. 
So next slide, please. So I just want to finish off by uh, when I when I wrote my book on uh, internment, I, I, I sort of stated that I seen it very much as a platform for further research, and there's been some good. So I just wanted to highlight you some recent research in this area. So we've Ifa Duffy's work on torture and human rights in Northern Ireland, and we also have Rosa Gilbert's work on no rent, no rates, civil disobedience against internment in Northern Ireland, 1971. So I suppose I would just finish off by saying that uh, yes, certainly internment was a failure. But maybe not for some of the reasons that people have been given. Uh, but maybe for maybe some more of the other reasons that I've indicated. And also it can be considered in some respects as being beneficial uh, to some groups. Thank you. Uh, Martin, thank you very much uh, for, for that. Um, we'll move on now to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Melissa Baird. Um, so Melissa is a PhD student uh, in um, history at Queen's University Belfast and she's researching the relationship between Irish America uh, and the uh, Northern Irish Civil Rights Movement between 1967 and 1972. Um, so Melissa is going to talk to us today about the impact uh, of internment on Irish America and I'm just calling up her slides now so just bear with me. There are. Hopefully you can see that. Ulster is becoming Britain's Vietnam, Irish America and the introduction of internment. Melissa, over to you. OK, thank you, Peter. And thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, I'm going to follow on just in with Martin was saying. Irish America is a huge arena in which internment is a success for certain groups, certainly in terms of increasing support um, for militant Irish republicanism. Um, so this project is part of my PhD. Um, it's kind of the latter part, so I thought I would have a lot more research done on it. Um, so the paper today is uh, primarily on the Irish American political support. Um, I would have liked to have had more research, but I can't go obviously with travel restrictions, um, which was funny whenever I was trying to put this together because one of the big um, problems for the US government at this time particularly for the American Consul General of Belfast in September 1971 is um, he's sitting in the old American consulate on Queen Street in Belfast and he's contemplating introducing travel restrictions to Northern Ireland for UK residents or for US residents um, and citizens. And of course, the cause of these travel restrictions aren't uh, a global pandemic, but it is this kind of explosion of violence that we have um, from 1971. But the US government don't introduce um, a blanket ban on travel. And even though they don't, they say that only those with urgent reasons should make the journey to Northern Ireland um, once we get into the latter part of 1971. But nonetheless, the events of this year prompt a flurry of transatlantic movement between the United States and Northern Ireland. And by movement, I mean movement of people. So this prompts a whole lot of um, politicians and journalists from America to travel to Northern Ireland, um, as well as Irish American or Irish Republicans and nationalists making their way to the States. And whether they are led into the States or not is something I'll mention. There's also the movement of contest across the Atlantic, um, which had been ongoing kind of for the past 10 years um, over the idea and rhetoric of civil rights colonialism, freedom, self-determination, um, and movement of objects. So huge uh, amounts of money is started to be raised in America and sent to Northern Ireland. And of course, guns, ammunition, travel as well. Um, so next slide, Peter. So this paper explores the role of Irish Americans in these exchanges demonstrating that the introduction of internment generated a massive response from the state work community. Um, and this response is channeled through rallies, demonstrations, fundraising, um, but as well the condemnation of international and American press coverage of Northern Ireland, as well as lobbying American politicians to intervene. Um, as this paper will discuss, Irish Americans couch the request for intervention on moralistic terms, emphasizing two things. So firstly, there was a responsibility um, that Irish Americans thought that America had to defend 
uh, freedom and justice. As well, there was a secondary um, element that Irish Americans and Americans had a duty towards Northern Ireland as a re result of the contributions of generations of Irish men, and they did only mention men, um, to the building and development of the physical and political landscape of um, the United States since independence from Britain. But unfortunately for Irish Americans, this moralistic approach was really at odds with President Nixon's strategic plan to scale back the role of the US from uh, global affairs. So Irish American action on our Northern Irish issues had lulled in 1970 in comparison with strong emerging responses um, in 1968 and 1969. Um, when there was civil rights clashes or when uh, the Battle of the Bogs had occurred or the introduction of British troops in August 1969. Um, so in this way, Irish-American nationalism, nationalism was quite reactionary and it mirrored the ebb and flow of events in Northern Ireland. So between the introduction of internment at the start of August and the deportation case of the IRA leader Joe Cahill from New York a few weeks later, 1971 intensified Irish American interest in Northern Ireland in unprecedented ways. Um, and for the uh, purposes of this event, I'm going to limit it to the confines of 1971, because after then, the events of Bloody Sunday really become completed um, and intertwined with how Irish Americans uh, lobby. So in this period, what we see emerge is that consolidation of a network of Irish Americans from Irish American Republicans um, who, read, who run groups like Noriad, the middle class Irish American lawyers and prominent individuals within Irish American civil society. And then finally, the elites um, who are part of the political establishment personified in figures like Ted Kennedy and Hugh Carey, half of what would go on to be known as the Four Horsemen. Next slide, Peter, please. So the Irish American response to Northern Ireland was widespread from August 1971. There was a massive response from Irish cultural and political organisations. They held rallies and pickets um, at British consulates, the Irish consulates, um, and different places. According to Just Department um, reports, Nori had sent $130,000 to Belfast between July and December 1971. And this was up from just $11,500 in the previous six months. The State Department reported receiving huge amounts of letters from concerned members of the public who were, quote, highly sympathetic to the Catholic population. The key three institutions um, which historically had shaped Irish American identity, so the Catholic Church, the Labour Movement and the Democratic Party, all come out strongly against internment as well although at times it did become a bipartisan issue. Um, the Ancient Order of Hibernians condemned, quote, the despicable application of special internment of the Catholic minorities as inhuman and disgraceful. The San Francisco Senate of Priests echoed Pope Paul's criticisms of the exceptional measures of security. And at the Executive Council meeting of the AFL-CIO, they unanimously adopted a resolution which condemned the Northern Irish government and called for, quote, an immediate end to the Hitlerian policy of internment without charge or trial, end quote. Next slide, Peter. Um, there was a vast response in 1971 against internment from American politicians in Congress and in the Senate. At least 21 resolutions were introduced throughout that year, including three concurrent resolutions. Similar to the public demands, these resolutions either requested the withdrawal of British troops, the end of internment and the Special Powers Act, the establishment of a UN peacekeeping mission, or the Northern Irish residents be given special refugee status. The most sig significant of these was co-sponsored by Senators Abraham Ribicroft and Edward Kennedy in October. This resolution called for the withdrawal of British troops and the establishment of a united Ireland. And Ribicroft described this resolution as, quote, the first attempt in the Senate to channel U.S. foreign policy towards seeking peace in Northern Ireland, end quote. And it was in the press statement for this resolution in which Kennedy warned Ulster is becoming uh, Britain's Vietnam. 
And as Tom pointed out before, scholars have pointed out that this, this wasn't the case. But this also reflected how Irish Americans tried to globalize this conflict in order to convince the American public um, to kind of get on board. And the key things in how Irish Americans portrayed the struggle in Northern Ireland shows that they understood this conflict as a colonial struggle. John O'Rourke, the president of the Leitrim Society of New York, wrote to the US government to say that it's urgent them to condemn, quote, the inhuman and barbarous treatment meted out by the Northern Ireland government of their helpless citizenry. The only other former colony which utilizes internment without trial or charge is South Africa, your condemnation of which we support, end quote. And many of these concerned writers did equate the situation in Northern Ireland with a lot of other struggles, specifically as well with Rhodesia. And they accused Britain of hypocrisy as they sanctioned and condemned minority rule there, while allowing a sizable minority of Northern Irish Catholics to be oppressed by an undemocratic system of government. At the same time, though, while Irish Americans connected Northern Ireland with other colonial struggles, there was an element of exceptionalism afforded to Northern Ireland, which was underpinned by white supremacy. One Irish American, Thomas Muldoon, wrote, quote, we have witnessed this type of cruelty before in Nazi Germany, Russia, the Middle East and Asia. But he also went on to say, quote, it's hard to understand in this year, 1971, that in intelligent English speaking people are involved in this type of conflict. In quote. Thus, while the context of decolonization in the early 1970s meant that Irish Americans could effectively draw these parallels, the notion of intelligence and speaking English still separated the case of Northern Ireland from other colonial or oppressive regimes. Next slide. Ireland's exceptionalism also applied in terms of how Irish Americans applied or lobbied for intervention. Irish Americans stressed the United States had a responsibility to Northern Ireland in return for the Irish contributions to American independence from Britain, as well as the development of the country's political and civil institutions. In a statement for the resolution, um, which is also on your screen, Senator, Senator Kennedy stated, the explosive situation in Northern Ireland transcends the traditional feelings of those who believe um, America should not intervene in the affairs of another nation. That principle is utterly without application here. There are ties between America and Ireland which simply cannot be ignored. The Irish yield to none in their contributions to the people and culture of America. Equally, a petition from prominent Irish Americans in Chicago, which was led by Mayor Richard Daly, called for intervention in Northern Ireland out of, quote, detestation of the horror visited on that section of Ireland in particular, which provided Washington with so many members of his army, end quote. So that Ireland had a hand in building and maintaining um, the American Republic and um, independence from Britain really provided Irish Americans with a rationale that they should get involved. The other way in which Irish Americans justified their role in Northern Ireland was a, based on a sense of America being this global protector of democracy and freedom. Congressman Kerry claimed that he wanted a solution in Northern Ireland, not only because of, quote, his love for, to, an, to an Irish ancestry, but because my American sense of justice is outraged by the innocence Killing, the killing of innocents and the increased levels of violence throughout Ulster, end quote. A Democratic Party official, James Keneally, wrote to Senator Fred Harris as well to say, we haven't hesitated where there has been persecution in many other countries, and I can't see why we can't go on record with Great Britain requesting that they take action to prevent bloodshed. And the interventions by these politicians, um, Stem largely from this group, um, which was the latest group to form out of concern for Northern Ireland, which was the American Committee for Ulster Justice. There had been a flurry of support groups um, emerge in the United States for NICRA between 1968 and 1969, but ideological splits had left these groups in disarray 
by 1970 and after Norrie had emerged in April 1970, it usurped a lot of this membership and following of previous groups. But Norrie's association with the IRA in 1970 at least repelled more respectable members um, of Irish American communities. As a result, Irish American elites pondered throughout um, 1971 about the creation of a new group. James Tully, an aide, um, the Congressman Hugh Carey, wrote in the summer of 1971, quote, what is needed here is a high level group of Irish Americans to mobilize American public opinion. There are other groups, but they haven't fully utilized the potential of influential Americans of Irish descent. And Paul O'Dwyer, who was um, one of the American committee's most prominent members, said that its aim is not to compete with any of the other groups here, but to influence the people who are several generations away from Ireland and who do not understand the situation, but are friendly disposed and who would shy away from other groups here. So the formation of the ACUJ provided the link between Irish American grassroots organisations and more elite members of Irish American society through the committee's association with people like Kerry and Kennedy. Moreover, the American committee also would provide a key resource of legal representation for various American citizens and residents who would be accused of gun running throughout the entirety of the trouble. And the American committee um, jumped into action immediately after internment was introduced, sending Congressman Kerry on a fact-finding mission um, to Northern Ireland in August. And Kerry's reports from this visit really informed a lot of Senator Kennedy's um, attitude towards the situation. Uh, next slide, Peter. And the, uh, the ACUJ's kind of significance would also really increase as well with the uh, deportation of Joe Cahill. So Joe Cahill here um, was an IRA leader who made the journey to New York on the 1st of September, 1971, they embark on a four week fundraising tour, which was organized by Noriad. And although he had received a visa for the United States a year previously, the US government revoked his visa while he was on route to the States. Um, he was detained on arrival on the 2nd of um, September, which is the photo on your left here. And the ACUJ's Frank, uh, leader, Frank Durkin, who was Paul O'Dwyer's uh, nephew, acted as Cahill's legal defence, but Cahill was nonetheless deported seven days later. But throughout this week, um, the Cahill case attracted widespread attention, and there was protests outside, which you can see on your right, outside the US Immigration Office in New York for the whole week. And Cahill told reporters that if he had not been deported, um, the Irish national cause would never have received this recognition. So that the State Department reported um, that the Cahill keeper had triggered quite a response from Irish Americans, and soon the letters from constituents began to pour in again. But these revealed that it wasn't just the American public um, who thought that their government was interfering with the Cahill case. Um, Congressman Stuart McKinney wrote to the Secretary of State, William, Robert, William Rogers, I assume that our action was based on per personal courtesy with the British Foreign Office, and I realise that in many cases this is widespread practice. However, I would ask that until facilities in Northern Ireland subside, the US government seek temporary release from that policy. The State Department resolutely denied that they had done this in uh, collusion with the British government. Um, and they said that there was no understanding with the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, but that he was just simply ineligible in the first place for a visa. Um, moreover, the State Department rejected the idea that the administration was trying to hamper um, Irish nationalists or Republicans from visiting, um, pointing out that the Republican Labour MP Paddy Kennedy had visited as well in August. But... The, the U.S. government would try to impede visitors from Irish Republicans or nationalists was particularly sensitive for Irish Americans who believed that the government was um, enabling or collaborating with um, the British to try and suppress what was going on in Northern Ireland. 
and they believed as well that um the press coverage from London or from international press outlets which informed a lot of um American press coverage as well parroted a British version of events next slide Peter So historian Andrew Wilson points out that major American newspapers did cover the introduction of internment extensively, but that the New York Times and the Christian Science Monitor condoned the policy in the beginning. The New York Times reported, the latest round of violence was touched off by Prime Minister Brand Faulkner's decision to invoke emergency powers of preventative detention as a means of controlling the terrorist activities of the underground Irish, American, Irish Republican Army. Um, it is these uncompromising bigots from both communities who bear responsibility for pushing Northern Ireland to the brink of civil war. Only the Irish can bring the stability to Northern Ireland. And Frank Durkin really castigates this analysis, stating that it will only become an Irish question to be solved by Irish people when the British army departs. Paul O'Dwyer as well accused the New York Times of censorship on Northern Irish issues by re not reporting on the Kennedy Ribicoff resolution or the press coverage given by, uh, or the press conference, sorry, given by Hugh Carey on his return from the UK in August. So going back to the Cahill case, this was the first instance in what would become a long standing problem for the US government in how to deal with visitors who had been or were active members of the IRA, as well as their general policy towards uh, American public support for the IRA. Internal memos reveal that officials in the department strongly opposed classifying the IRA as a prescribed organisation, as it would include former members, which would also include Eamon de Valera, which would be very awkward. Moreover, officials are challenged that it wasn't clear at that time, so they're speaking in um, maybe uh, around September uh, 1971, that all IRA IRA members supported violence and quote, we have been given visas to prominent IRA members for years and to suddenly turn them off would appear rather capricious, not to mention the domestic storm it would cause, end quote. So the Irish American lobby were clearly having some impact on the department's thinking, but beyond this, the pressure from Congress failed to budge the administration's stance on non-intervention. While the Irish American lobbying focused on the morality of intervention, this just didn't con contribute to Nixon's foreign policy objectives and indeed risked antagonising their closest ally, the UK government. The State Department issued a generic response to both public and political requests, saying that, quote, we see no practical way in which the United States activities could successfully supplement or replace the already intense efforts of those responsible authorities in Britain and Ireland, end quote. But they did privately acknowledge that internment was unlikely to be effective, but the State Department maintained that they had to maintain, or they had to treat it as an internal affair of a friendly country. Um, and that idea about being friendly really was reiterated time and time again um, in both how they uh, cited both relations with Ireland and with uh, Britain. The Director of European Affairs in the State Department, Scott George, wrote to the Secretary of State, wrote that the Secretary of State, quote, has strong personal feelings on this one. He considers that with all the hassles we have to get involved in, there's no good reason to involve ourselves in this one. So Irish-American assertions that Northern Ireland demanded US intervention clearly fell short to the State Secretary. And it was clear that unless this became a domestic problem for the United States, it wouldn't qualify as something that they were going to get involved in. So to conclude then, what we see appear in 1971 is the major uh, stumbling blocks that would occur over the next 30 years in how the US government dealt with the response um, from Irish America to the IRA as well as how to negotiate this domestic pressure from Irish Americans while maintaining a good relationship with the UK government. But more significantly, the events of 1971 really forges links within Irish America that, stay, that goes from um, Irish Americans on the ground, so groups like Norad, 
the, the Irish Americans in courtrooms and then finally Irish Americans in the halls of government. Thank you. Melissa, thank you so much for that, that great paper. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, we're going to move on to our, our third and final speaker in this panel. Then we'll we'll have questions to um, all our presenters. So our third speaker is Liam Stone, who is a community activist uh, from Ballamurphy and who has long been involved in the campaign for the recognition of the Ballamurphy massacre in 1971. That's what Liam is going to talk to us about today. Um, uh, internment the Ballon Murphy massacre and the impact on the nationalist community. I'm just going to put up uh, Liam's slides and then Liam, if you tell me when you want me to move those on. Thanks very much, Peter. It's over to you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Uh, you're all very welcome from Ballon Murphy where I am sitting now at the minute. Part of a challenge for, as Peter says, I was a member of the Ballon Murphy massacre campaign for over 20 years. And part of the challenge for ourselves was to try and get it across to people just exactly what life was like for us here in Polymorphy. Essentially between the summer of 1969 and maybe the summer of 74, the intensity of it. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine in Lurgan asked me, would I be able to speak to uh, about the massacre? And I thought it was to a small group of people. I didn't realise it was to this group of people. People. But nonetheless, we are here, and uh, so I have a couple of slides just to run through, uh, Peter. And the uh, shock and stun was the working title of the British Army's operation in Ballymurphy in August 1971. Uh, a lot of people go through, uh, use the, the title Operation Demetrius, but their working title in relation to Ballymurphy was shock and stun. That uh, gives you reminiscences of America's, I'm not too sure what their work intent was in relation to the invasion of Iraq. And the, the quote below is from Kevin Myers, a journalist who uh, was actually witness to many of the events in Ball Murphy in, in 70, 71 and 72. And the reason why I'm using Kevin Myers is because I think it's safe to assume that he wouldn't agree with the political direction that Paul Murphy has taken since then, but nonetheless that he was a, a, an eyewitness to the events. Newborn'sly Paul Murphy was hell, a largely intentional hell, that somebody decided that they were going to uh, use ourselves to, if you want to, give a lesson to the nationalist people. Next slide please, Peter. In terms of the internment, 11 people died and over 30 more were wounded. If the British Army had had their way, we could potentially have been talking about 40 people dead during this shock and stun operation. 30 wounded, uh, many of them going to local hospitals, others, as we know, going to hospitals down south. Frank Quentin, the first person who was shot was a man called Bobby Clark, who is still dealing with survivor's guilt to this day. He is firmly of the opinion, and nothing that we can say to him will change him, is that if he hadn't have been shot, then these 11 people wouldn't have died. Survivor's guilt. Frank Quinn was married. He had a daughter a couple of months old. His wife was expecting. Uh, he ran out to help Bobby Clark whenever Bobby Clark was the first pers person wounded. Father Mullen uh, had actually phoned the local barracks and told them that he was going to give support to uh, Bobby Clark and to for the British soldiers to stop firing. He, he went out waving the white flag, was shot dead. Noel Phillips was uh, 19 years of age. He was shot in the bum, in the arch. Unlike most people who are wounded, he was calling out for his mommy. And Joan Connolly says to Noel, Noel, don't worry, son, don't worry, uh, I'm coming out. Joan was of the belief that uh, because she was a woman, she wouldn't be shot by the British soldiers. She was actually shot three times and left to bleed to death. 
uh, where she was shot. Danny Taggart, a father of 13, uh, was shot 14 different times. Josie Murphy, he was shot in the groin, brought into the Henry Taggart uh, barracks, brutalized, and died three weeks later. Eddie Doherty, a father of four, shot on the second day of the massacre. Uh, his wife died seven years after Eddie uh, died, and the four kids were brought up by, by uh, relatives. John Lowry, uh, an innocent, innocent in the broadest sense of the word, uh, young lad in the area, uh, shot on the mountain only, shot alongside Joe Core. Uh, the extra significance of the killing of John Lowry and Joe Core is that General Sir Michael Jackson actually put out a statement full of lies in relation to the killing of John Lavery and Joe Core. And at the inquest, conveniently, he developed a bad memory that he just couldn't remember what statements he had put out. Paddy McCarthy was actually a former member of the Irish Guards, an Englishman, despite his name, Paddy McCarthy. He was a former member of the Irish Guards who left the Irish Guards because of the behaviour of the British Army in Malaysia. Paddy was put through uh, a mock execution, a shot fired over his head. He uh, took a heart attack and dropped dead. John McCurr had fought against fascism in North Africa, had lost a red arm and was shot dead as far as we're concerned, although the the inquest judge, Siobhan Keegan, says she couldn't determine who shot him. As far as we're concerned, the British Army shot him. Uh, and the soldier, they put out a statement saying he was operating a rifle without realising that he had no right arm, he had a prosthetic uh, right arm. In the aftermath of the killings, Danny Taggart's missus put in a claim for compensation. And the judge says, to Mrs. Taggart, consider yourself lucky that you're getting a widow's pension and that you have one less mouth to feed. Jenny Quigley, uh, an English Quaker who had came to Ballamurphy in the summer of 1970, had set up a playgroup in the house that she lived in in Glenlina Park in, in the estate. And it was only years afterwards that she told me that the children stopped playing after the massacre. That for six months, they didn't go near the playgroup. That hadn't registered with me. I suppose I was just uh, conscious of trying to stay alive. But with Jenny, the children stopped playing. And she, she says she remembers the first day that they came back to the playgroup. What she says was that there was a, a soft fall of snow. She was delighted that the kids had went back into their playgroup. And whenever she turned on the news that afternoon, Bloody Sunday had happened in Derry. So the kids stopped playing. Next slide, please, uh, Peter. So in terms of the killings of uh, in Ballamurphy in August 1971, from our perspective, there was no accountability whatsoever. There was no legal accountability, no judicial no political, certainly no political. The media simply regurgitated the lies that had been put out by uh, Lisburn Theophil Borix, by General Sir Mike Jackson, simply just repeated it, repeated the lie that Joan Conley, a mother of eight, was shot dead operating a heavy machine gun. Just simply repeated it. And uh, as far as the church was concerned, uh, we weren't happy with the lack of public demands. There was one or two statements from the church, but as far as we were concerned, the Catholic Church, who was uh, in a position of authority at that time, should have been doing more to have made the uh, British uh, Army more accountable. Next slide, please, Peter. I have difficulties whenever people refer to what we went through as the troubles, because it, 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 it makes it so nice and easy and soft. The reality is that we lived in the middle of a war zone. 
certainly for the first five years of the early 1970s, if the same activity had taken place in Britain, 100,000 people would have died, or in America, half a million. And that's the reality of life for us here in Balmurphy in the early 70s. As I says to someone there the other week, you simply can't say that the people in Bangor and North Down went through the same experiences as what we did here in Balmurphy in West Belfast. Next slide, please, Peter. The actions of the British Army starting in the early 1970s uh, from, as, and I see that Martin uh, used the borrowed earlier on. In that period, British policies in Ireland have transformed a transient working class community with little interest in politics into a square made of solid anti-state conspiracy. And I think that there is evident not only during the 70s, but through the 80s, 90s, and into uh, this time frame as well. Next slide, please, uh, Peter. Again, back to uh, Kevin Myers on a blog that he wrote in the 21st of May. Talking about the parachute regiment, what he says is, but it's too easy to blame them and them alone. Their brutality and their taste for murder must have long been known to army command and ultimately to the British government. Not content with the 1971 slaughter and Bloody Sunday and Darien in 72, the Paris conducted a second Balamorphy massacre in July 72 when five people were shot dead in minutes, including another priest. One of those killed was 13 year old Margaret Gargan. Many years later, a former member of the Paris told me that an NCO involved in his training has boasted of shooting her. The killer positively identified Margaret as a young girl in a dress. He even remembered the colour and then he deliberately shot her. The people of Balamorphy had to put up with contact like that every day during these times. One of their victims was 19 year old Liam Holden, who was beaten, tortured and even waterboarded by Paris into admitting shooting a soldier and then served 17 years in jail for a crime he did not commit. Uh, in relation to the Springhill killings, their inquests were just uh, reopened there on, they got notification on Wednesday that their uh, inquests are due to be heard shortly. Liam Holden was actually the last person sentenced to be hung in the North in uh, early 1973. He was reprieved, spent 17 years in jail. When he got out, he started a campaign to prove his innocence, which was accepted. I think about 10 years ago. And uh, I think it's interesting that most people associate waterboarding with Americans and their dealings in uh, Guantanamo, I think it is. Uh, but yet here we have British soldiers who were using waterboarding on people from Balmurphy in 1972. Next slide, please, Peter. The square mile of anti-state conspiracy was totally surrounded on all sides by major British Army or RUC bases. Andersonstown RUC, British Army base, Fort Mona, Fort Whitrock, Henry Taggart. Add to the Henry Taggart that the British Army had taken over a local primary school, the Fear Foster Primary School in Moyard, Black Mountain British Army base, Springfield Parade, Fort McCrory, uh, it was accepted uh, at all times that the Bl British Army was uh, stationed on the Black Mountain and, and encouraged Timber Yard from where they launched their attack on the Spring Hill Massacre in July 1972. Next slide, please, Peter. Of course, there was resistance from the square mile of uh, anti-state conspiracy. And I just was thinking about it that that square mile actually produced five leading military commanders of the various Republican armies uh, that was active in Ireland. 
Uh, you would have Jim Brayson from the Provisional IRA in the comparison with Tom Barry, Brian Keenan, who lived locally and um, was uh, described by Jonathan Paul as the number one enemy of the British state. Joe McCann uh, from the official IRA, who was shot in the back by paratroopers in, I think it was May 1972. Ronnie Bonton, Chief of Staff of the INLA, and Q Torney, Chief of Staff of the IPLO. During that period from this area, According to uh, a survey carried out in the late 1980s by uh, a, a, a prisoner support group, Tushnu, we had approximately 700 political prisoners from a population of just over 11,000. The longest serving political prisoner uh, was from the Baltimore Fury, served 23 uh, years in different uh, jails, and Baltimore prisoners were involved in uh, at least 21 escapes. Next slide, Peter. The borrowed in the conclusion to his book, uh, uh, The Second Edition in 2000, I think the, the bottom couple of lines of his phrase is the one that I want to highlight the most. The hand of friendship has been extended by Irish nationalism. Unionism can either grasp it or flail about blindly as a ground shifts beneath its feet, but there is no road back. The bridges to the past have all been burnt. The Borrowed uh, published that in the year 2000, 21 years ago, and I just thought that it was significant to just to put that up there as well. So that's a quick run through, Peter. Um, Obviously, we're going into a question and answer session now. I was very conscious that we were running late. Uh, I didn't want to keep everybody else back. That's great, Liam. Thank you very much for that presentation. A very powerful statement. Um, so we have uh, 15 or 20 minutes now for, for questions to our three speakers, um, to Liam, uh, Melissa and Martin. So uh, again, uh, people want to ask a question. If you use the little button on your screen with the hand in the face and just click the hand, just click the hand icon when that comes up, that will just indicate to me that you want to to ask a question. So uh, over to you now. Open. Uh, it's open to the floor. Yeah, Gail, you, you you're first. Yeah, um, it's a question for Liam. Liam, thank you so much. I find that really moving and unfortunately still shocking. Um, and I've just been so moved by the coverage um, of, of late. I just wanted to ask you if you have a source for the um, the shock and stun phrase that's really stayed with me and I've written something that's going to there's going to be a note in it about Bally Murphy and if I can if I can give that a source, I'd be really glad to. Do you know where that language comes from? Yeah, that, that came from part of the research that the campaign group uh, yeah, pulled together. Uh, was, was it Gail? Well, probably an idiot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, get, I'll, I'll get that there to you uh, later. I, I got that from John Taggart, whose father was killed during the, who was the leader of the Moscow campaign. Uh, I'll get that there to you uh, later on if you want to buy me an email address or whatever. Thank you. I'll yeah. do that. I'll, maybe I'll pass that to Peter. Thanks so yes, much. Yes, certainly, certainly. Uh, okay, Rosanna, you're next. Hi. Um, thank you for some really good and thought-provoking um, papers. I just wanted to ask Melissa about whether there was much um, ordinary emigration fr from Northern Ireland to America as a result of of people fleeing the violence, fleeing the conflict, and if so, how, how, if at all, does that fuel the American response? Uh, so, so, yeah, um, the American Consul as uh, General, he reports that there is an influx of uh, request for visas but he is quite skeptical in that he thinks that half of the visas um are for ira members 
So there is that cynical attitude within the um, the American government of determining how um, they verify whether this is a refugee status um, or not. And one of the main things that um, Senator James Buckley, he introduces a, res a resolution asking for 25,000 special refugee status for um, exactly what you said, for uh, members of Northern Ireland trying to flee. Um, and there's just a lot of pushback on that because they say that there's no way to determine who of these would be genuine refugees. And when they say genuine, they don't really give a lot of language on what they mean by that either. Um, so there is an influx, but there's a lot of pushback from the administration as well. Um, more generally, there had been a long-standing resentment within Irish America because the 1965 Immigration Act, they said that that stymied Irish, Amer Irish immigration in the first place. So that had been a long hail kind of um, gripe within Irish America that Irish people weren't able to come to the United States or move there anymore. Um, and again, there was a lot of racism actually within um, their, how they articulated that in saying that um, like there was a lot of uh, letters from different people saying, you know, we're getting the Italians, we're getting the Indians. What about the Irish? And that's literally the, the language that they would have used. Um, so there was a lot of pressure from Irish Americans to allow more immigration from Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh, the next question is from Paul Reed Kavanagh. Well, thank you, Martin, and thank you, Liam, for your uh, your presentation. My question, though, is from Melissa, uh, referring to the the relationship between uh, the United States and Northern Ireland. And I, I actually think I want to go a little bit more of like a U.S.-U.K. question, maybe between the, the relationship between Nixon and Heath. Um, do you think part of it really was that uh, Nixon didn't want to get involved in Northern Ireland? Or do you think there were larger issues in 1971 as far as the Cold War? Uh, maybe uh, that Nixon was going to support Heath's, uh, Britain's membership in the EEC, and that maybe while Britain wasn't involved in Vietnam, that there was a bit of a, a support of the Vietnam policy. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about the wider US-UK relationship at this time outside of, of Irish America. So with the EEC um, in the report, from the State Department, um, they are quite happy to latch on to the idea that entrance into the EEC um, by the UK and Ireland might alleviate uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland. So I think that they do support it at the time. Um, with the Cold War, I think actually by the 1970s, the rhetoric had kind of um, in the late 1960s, the State Departments are continually saying that Northern Irish re uh, refugees shouldn't be allowed in because they're not victims of communism. But that line is actually dropped by 1971. So I think Nixon's priority is changing away from the Cold War. Um, and it is more just generally this idea of the US becoming, in, becoming involved in less struggles. Um, than necessary the Cold War because there is that shift in the rhetoric that the State Department uses. Um, so I think that they are they're more happy just with the scale back um, approach. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Paul Rick. Um, I think our next question is uh, from Paddy Mulroe. Yep. Um, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed all the presentations there. Just for Martin. Uh, just Martin on internment, I think um, I'd be of the view, similar to yourself, that it had a huge role in spreading violence, particularly to border areas. But I'm interested in your view on the impact it had on the internal dynamic within the Republican movements at the time. So if you go to places like Tyrone and South Armagh, they would have been very much leaning towards the official Republican movement at that stage. But you know, at the beginning of internment, but by 1972, they'd probably switched more to the provisional sort of movement. And do you think internment had an effect on that switch within the Republican movement in those areas?
Yeah, can you hear me now, Paddy? Hey, Martin, yep. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I suppose um, I can only really go on my own experience of, of living in, in Lurgan and County Armagh in relation to the question. And I do know that the official area was in the early 70s, was after 69, was pretty strong in Lurgan. And the support for it did dissipate after internment. And people started going towards the provisional movement, movement because they were seen it was being more military effective. And people wanted to head back. You know, if you think, uh, and I suppose one of the points I make, a lot of people, although I say that they had good information on people, there's a lot of people arrested who had nothing to do with the Republican movement. So the fact that they're arrested, you know, people say, well, we might as well, we need to do something about this. They're going to put us in jail. They're going to arrest us, no matter where we're uh, innocent or not, or where we are supported to officials or whatever. So, so there was that movement, not just from the officials, but from the general nationalist community towards the provisions, because people just said, you know, we need to be involved in a group that's more proactive and taking on the British state. So I'd agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Martin. Thank you. Okay, um, next question is from Damien, Damien Downs. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I, I guess there are two parts to my question, I suppose. The, the first is in relation to, um, you know, I, I think sending the powers in into Bally Murphy in August 71, or indeed in Derry in 72, I think you know what you're going to get with the powers. So somebody had to make that decision. Um, I'm curious to know how that decision was made. If the British Army didn't think that internment was a good idea, um, you know, and, and I guess this question goes out to all the panelists, including from the earlier session, you know, if, if, if it wasn't a good idea in the British Army's opinion, why put a force like the Paris on the ground on those days? And, uh, and I'm even thinking later then in December, Gen General Carver uh, in December of 71, you know, the, the, a month before Bloody Sunday, was urging a, a more softly, softly approach to dealing with, um, with, with particularly Derry. So who was making the decision to send uh, a group like the Paris into these uh, very sensitive areas? Liam, if you're there, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> well, I was hoping that a Melissa or Martin would have jumped in there. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, Damien. Uh, whenever I've been doing some work with uh, ex British soldiers, um, if you want to just accept that the Balamorphy Reds in April 1970, that uh, the British Army took a hammer in the sense that they had the more reinforcements had to be sent into Balmurphy to cope with what was called the Balmurphy Rats. Ex-British soldiers have told me that that would have played a part in the culture of inter-regimental rivalry, banter, or whatever. Right? That the kids from Balmurphy beat usins, but we're going to go in and we're going to show them it's who's boss. There could be an element of that there. As to who was to send them in, I don't know. I think it's more pertinent in relation to Derry in January 72, because if they weren't given explicit orders to do what they'd done in Derry, the commanders should have known what way they would have behaved because of the way that they behaved in Balmurphy in, in August 71. So essentially, I, I don't know who said it send the, the parachute regiment into Palmerfee in August 71. Thanks, Martin. Martin anything, anything you want to add, Martin, on that? Sorry, uh, no, I, I've been in the same ship, as the same boat as Liam. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know, but uh, I was just thinking maybe Arn would, would maybe have some idea of the sort of structures for that or, or, or what, what the operational way, how that was, would have been uh, organised. I don't know if is Aaron still still with us. He is. Not sure. Might have might have dropped out. Yes, yeah, so I'm here. Answer. I'm here. I heard the question. Uh, I think these things they come from the top uh, in terms of a chain of command. So 
you know, again, the attentions must focus on the brigade commander for the, the area, Frank Kitson. And so those those um, plans are generated at that sort of level um, up to and including what later on becomes the sort of post of commander land forces. But the decision will be taken at a high level, presumably in headquarters, Northern Ireland and Lisbon. I can answer that, I think. <laughs> Uh, it's Tom Hennessy. Um, it's just a question of it's a law and order situation. They have to restore order and the powers are regrettably the most re efficient uh, battalion in restoring order on the ground. And that's how they look at it. They don't they don't go into what who did what. They accept the soldiers points of view. Um, they don't go too far in in exploring what happened. And also there's a wider thing about trying to they have constant pressure in NATO having to move battalions into into Northern Ireland and there's a constant pressure that they have to they have to dilute what their commitment is to NATO and that is also um, a factor as well. Okay thanks Tom. Um, I think we, we could take two more questions uh, so Kerry Fitzsimmons first. Thanks very much, um, Peter, uh, and thanks very much to all the speakers. This is really, really interesting and powerful. Um, I'm from Belfast myself, and my research um, focuses on the troubles in the north, and so this was really informative and really, really, really helpful. Um, my question is for, I suppose, Liam. Um, like, being from Ballymer for yourself, do you think that there's always been a discussion about the level of press between... Um, like the difference of level of press between Bella Murphy and Bloody Sunday, and do you think there's ever been a sort of a hierarchy of press coverage, and then that that in turn then creates the hierarchy of victims? Because Bloody Sunday, for years, the press talked about it, and it was always because the press were there that day, I suppose, like on the actual day. Whereas Bella Murphy, there weren't any press, and because of it, there was a lot more silence and a lot more of the community having to fight and raise their voice. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on um, yeah media coverage and stuff. Well, well, Bloody Sunday was definitely a public massacre, mm. uh, Kerry. It was yeah. Kerry. We, we can all remember the TV footage of Bishop Daly carrying uh, one of the victims while he was waving a white flag. Mm -hmm. And them images went around the world within minutes. Uh, the Bill Murphy massacre w was carried out in private, there was no TV crews and things like that. Plus, the lies that was put out by General Sir Mike Jackson was accepted as being the the truth, in mm -hmm. comments, the truth. And the media just simply regurgitated that there. Uh, so the, the Bill Murphy families did have uh, an uphill ba battle uh, in uh, getting their case heard. The other thing you, you have to bear in mind, Carrie, is that a lot of the families had lost their figureheads, Joan, Danny Taggart, Josie Murphy, and the difficulties that that presented over the next 20, 25 years about just living. Mm. And it was only with the ceasefires of 94, 98, that the families, the families were very conscious not to be mounting a campaign while other people were still being killed, believe it or believe it not. And it was only with the ceasefires and the space that was created in the late 1980s that the families came together to start to mount their, their own campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question, Kerry. So um, the last question for the session uh, goes to our Queen's colleague, Margaret O'Callaghan. Sorry, Peter. Sorry. Thanks for all those brilliant papers. Um, they're really interesting. Just on the penultimate point about what happens between Bally Murphy and Bloody Sunday, I've never worked the kind of high political papers for this period. It's a question kind of for Aaron and Tom as well, maybe. Is there an actual way we could trace if there was discussion? First of all, at cabinet level, was there any discussion? And secondly, is there any way of tracking through army records whether there was discussion on the whole question of using the paras again? Sorry. 
Th Aaron, thanks for that, Margaret. Yeah, yeah. I've just I, I actually have a, a document uh, from the National Archives. It's a record of the parachute regiment's uh, time uh, deployed there, um, and uh, it's just a regimental history. It doesn't say who uh, approved that rotation of units. So the second battalion moves from Derry. In, in the f from where it was in the first half of 1971 to backfill or to replace uh, the third battalion in Belfast in June. I think it's June time, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't give any record as to you know who ordered that. It wouldn't necessarily follow that one parachute battalion would uh, relieve another. I don't think it. So the answer um, would be somewhere in the hierarchy of HQ and higher headquarters, Northern Ireland. The decision would have been taken, I think, that has something to do with what Tom has already has already mentioned and uh, reputation in terms of reputation of that uh, regiment. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's. I think you've got to remember that the um, the cabinet in London, most of those senior mem ministers that dealt with the. Um, uh, Northern Ireland had all been in the army and they'd all served in the army and had all been through the army in the Second World War and they genuinely believed that the British Army had a difficult job to do and uh, in difficult circumstances and they took the advice of the commanders on the ground such as um, uh, Farah Hockey and uh, Hockley and um, Ford and Tuzo and they believed they were doing a good job and in the circumstances i think they that it was just an institutional blind spot they just believed that they were doing a good job they had a difficult job to do um, they were taking casualties and they had a public order problem and they believed that they were doing the best job they they had the same situation in cyprus aden and even going back to Malaya, they didn't question, they didn't, they didn't micromanage what the army were doing. They trusted their commanders and their decision. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Thank, uh, thanks everyone for their their great questions uh, to this panel. We're, we're going to take a break now for for lunch. Uh, before we go, uh, can I thank on your behalf our three speakers, uh, Melissa Baird, uh, Liam Stone, and Martin McCleary, who all, all given fantastic presentations and given us a lot to think about. Um, we'll we'll reconvene again at two o'clock, um, so I, I hope uh, most of you can, can join us again for this afternoon session. Until then, um, have a good break. Thank you.